in Flushing, New York, and you're watching Subaru's Mets on Deck. Tonight, the Mets take on the Phillies in the third of this four-game series. But prior to that game, we have another game. It'll feature the 1973 Mets against the 73 world champion Oakland A's and the upper deck heroes of the game. But before we talk about what's going on off the, I should say, on the field, let's take a look at what has happened off the field with the New York Mets. Darren Jackson is now a Met coming down from the Toronto Blue Jays, even up for Tony Fernandez, who rejoins the Toronto Blue Jays, where he started his career. Now, the Mets also made some other moves. They gave Paul Gibson his unconditional release, and they optioned to Norfolk. Wayne Housie coming up from AAA will be Dave Tailgater and Kevin Baez. Now, as I mentioned, prior to the regular scheduled game tonight, the Mets of 73 will take on the Oakland A's of 1973, and I mentioned the world champion. How did the Mets get into the World Series? Well, let's take a quick recap of that New York Mets season. When the 1973 baseball season began, New York Mets fans were counting on a banner year. Finally, with enough offensive plunge in their lineup, such as 23-year-old slugger John Milner, New York appeared to be off to the races with a crack of the bat. The home opener sparked optimism. Tom Seaver was on the mound for New York, and catcher Jerry Grody was throwing them out on the bases. Cleon Jones opened the season with two home runs off Phillies A. Steve Carlton, and the Mets were victorious 3-0. As a result of some key injuries, New York found itself in the cellar by the first week of July. Cleon Jones out for 50 games. Willie Mays missed 50 games. Rookie George Theodore missed half a season with a dislocated hip. Catcher Jerry Grody out for 56. And shortstop Buddy Harrelson was sidelined for over 50 games. With Tug McGraw urging his teammates on with You Got to Believe, the Mets did just that. With a now healthy staff, the Mets were on the comeback trail, winning 29 of their next 43, finding themselves in the midst of a six-team scramble for first place. And it was Tug McGraw who put it all together for the Mets. In his last 19 games, a lefty was unstoppable, with 12 saves and 5 wins and a stunning 0.88 ERA. It was only fitting that it beat Tug McGraw on a relief against the Cubs in Chicago to help the Mets clinch the National League Eastern Division title. Next stop for New York was Cincinnati to face the National League West champs, the Reds. After splitting the series in Cincinnati, the Mets returned to Shea for Game 3. The Mets made it easy for Jerry Kuzman by scoring nine runs, and Kuz coasted to a 9-2 win. The Mets led two games to one. But in Game 4, Pete Rose evened the series with a home run in the top of the 12th, tying the series at 2. It was Tom Seaver on the mound for the Mets in the 5th and deciding game, with a 7-2 lead in the 9th and the Reds threatening with bases loaded and one out. Manager Yogi Berra brought in Tug McGraw to get the final two outs of the game and clinch the National League title. Stay with us. When we come back here to Shea Stadium, we will reminisce with Red Foley. Oh, well, back here at Shea Stadium watching Subaru's Mets on deck. We told you how the Mets did in 73. We recapped the season. Now let's take a cursory scan of the World Series. Starting off with Game 1, Mets scored only one run in the fourth when Cleon Jones doubled in John Milner. And a foul with an RBI single. Ken Olsen pitched five innings, 
fingers ended up in that ball game. Holtzman got the win. Also, Daryl Knowles pitched a little bit in the ninth. John Matlock took the loss. Now, game two, they were tied at six in the 12th inning when Willie Mays got his last major league hit. Gave the Mets a 7-6 lead. Then Mike Andrews committed two errors, and the Mets went on to win 10-7. That ball game took four hours and 13 minutes. How about game three? The Mets got off to a 2-0 lead in the first. Bert Campaneris delivered the game-winning run, and Raleigh Fingers finished off New York in the 11th. Game four, the hero was Rusty Staub, who was 4-4. Four for four. Drove in five runs to tie the series at two. Game five, Jerry Kuzman gave up only three hits in six in the third inning. Tech McGraw relieved in the seventh and escaped the bases loaded jams. The bases loaded jam. Mets led the series 3-2. But game six, Tom Seaver pitching with just three days rest. Held the A's to six hits over seven innings. Mets losing that ball game 3-1 to one to the Oakland A's. Catfish Hunter, the winning pitcher. As you can see, Seaver get the loss. Fingers a save in that game. And on to game seven. First Oakland home run of the series off John Matlick by their shortstop, Bert Campanaris. After three innings, the, the A's had a 4-0 lead. They went on to win the final game of that series, 5-2. The winning pitcher, Kenny Holtzman, and the losing pitcher, John Matlick. Daryl Knowles got the save. So the Oakland A's were the 1973 world champions. And now joining me in the booth right now, a man who covered the New York Mets back in 1973, Red Foley. Red, you were writing for the New York Daily News back. That's right. Tell me, Red, uh, your memories of the 73 season. Well, you know, the funny part about that, uh, that club was going bad almost all season long. They were nine, ten games back uh, in late August, in September almost. What happened was it, the division really didn't have a standout club. In fact, there are a lot of people thought if that season went a week longer, the Mets would have finished third. <laughs> it was just the season ended. And they were hot. They won, I think it was nine in a row and 11 of 13 or something like that, or seven out of nine. Or, and uh, they ended up on top. They won, what, 80, was it 82 games? They were three games over 500. And then they beat Cincinnati, which was the big red machine, which later won, you know, two more world championships in the playoff and then ended taking uh, Oakland to the ninth inning of the seventh game. A lot of people don't realize when Wayne Garrett made the last out, I believe he was either the tying or go-ahead run. Going into that World Series, as, as I mentioned in just a few moments, the Oakland A's of 73, the world champion Oakland A's, will take on the world, uh, the 1973 New York Mets team. And going into that World Series, Red, did, did the uh, Mets feel they were a definite underdog to the Oakland A's or everything was even? Uh, the Mets were a funny kind of a club. Actually, I didn't cover the playoff. I was covering uh, uh, Oakland and, uh, and Baltimore, but... The Mets were a kind of a team because of their pitching. You got Seaver, Kuzman, Matlack, and they had the idea that if those guys were on, they could beat the 1927 Yankees on any <laughs> given day, and that's the way they felt. And everything was rolling for them. Uh, the one thing about the Mets, they never believed that they were going to lose, no matter when they, you know, who they were playing or anything. It was the same way in '69 against Baltimore. The one thing I re recall about that World Series is Mike Andrews. Yeah, yeah, he made two errors in that Sunday game out there. And I can remember he, they came back here and he, he came in as a pinch as a pinch hitter after Bowie Kuhn ordered him return to the uh, roster. And he grounded out, you know, late in the game, got a standing ovation when he was introduced, got a standing ovation when he was going back to the dugout. And I remember the cameras were on Charlie Finley and Charlie just sat there without making any smile or grimace or anything else. It was like he was reading the signs on the outfield fence or something. But uh, that, was a, that was a screwy World Series. Uh, and, and, and let's keep in mind now, Mike Andrews was, uh, well, Charlie Finley wanted to replace him because of the errors in the World Series, but his teammates came to his defense. Well, the day they came in here after flying you know, back for game three, they had a workout here. And I can't remember Mike Andrews' number. It just escapes me, but... They had, uh, they took a adhesive tape and cut it into Mike, and they, they stuck it on their arm or on the front of their uh, warm-up suits and went out here in an afternoon, I guess the afternoon before the third game. And that was one of, that was their way of showing that Mike Andrews was their man. Red, you, you're pretty much aware of baseball throughout the years. You know your history. Did the Oakland A's of 73 remind you at all of the old Gas House gang? Well... Uh, I suppose in a way because uh, they were fighting 
you never knew there was fights on the field. They fought, uh, not only they fight the opposing team, they had fights in the clubhouse. I can remember the next year when they were playing the Dodgers, before the first game there was the usual workout, and we're all around the batting cage and somebody comes running out to say that there was a fight inside the clubhouse, <laughs> you know. And the game hadn't even started. It was two, it was, uh, two guys in there having a fight. But, uh, hey, that team won three world championships, 72, 73, 74. And it's been a long time since anybody will do that again. That was a great ball club. Uh, it's, that's why I think today it's too bad Reggie isn't here or Catfish Hunter. Uh, they were they were some big names on that team. Very important, Catfish Hunter and Reggie Jackson. They are they will not participate in the Upper Deck Heroes of the Game today, but we will bring you all the action right here on Sports Channel. So stay right there. Subaru Mets on Deck is brought to you by Vacation Connecticut. We're full of surprises. When the weather heats up, there's only one place to be. place for cool summer action. I'm well, back here at Shea Stadium in Flushing, New York, and you're going to watch all the action from Upper Deck Heroes of the Game on Sports Channel. I'm Fran Healy, joined by Red Foley up here in the booth and downstairs in the dugout in uniform, wearing his number 10, and he played in the same uniform he's wearing today, Mr. Rusty Staub. Rusty. There's Rusty. Francis. We're going to do some interviews with the guys in the different dugouts. A lot of the Oakland A's, some of the former Mets. So uh, it should be interesting. We'll find out what they've been doing in their lives. Well, Rusty, I'll, I'll throw it back up to you. Rusty, let me ask you a question now. Um, you're not scheduled to bat, but for us here at Sports Channel, we want to see you bat. Will you do it? You're breaking up a little bit, Francis. If you ask me if I'm hitting, no, I'm not. <laughs> we're not breaking <laughs> up that much, Dad. You heard it. Well, you're not going to go on the field. We're surprised. I mean, you look like you could still play. Well, I'll tell you what. If you saw me jog, you'd know better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rusty, before you uh, get into your interviews, what do you remember about 73? Well, 73 was a, the greatest thing that I remember about it was how we came together as a team at the end of the season. Uh, we were in last place at the end of August. I think we won 21 out of the last 28 games. Uh, I think we only won 82 games in our division that year. Uh, whatever it was, it was it was the most incredible comeback. They called the 69 team the Miracle Mets, but the real miracle really took place in 1973. You know, Rusty, right now you can't see it, but on the monitor our viewers are watching you throw somebody out at home plate. We also saw you get a double. When I'm Jerry Grody just missed that tag red fully. Yeah, I know he did, but the umpire city got him. But a perfect look at Rusty Stam going. What a great play that was. Huh? Guys, you're breaking up. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Okay, well, Rusty, we'll get back downstairs to you. We want to thank you very much, and we're hoping that you'll change your mind and get on that field. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rusty Staub, a favorite here in New York and had an outstanding career, 2,700 hits. He'll be interviewing the players as we go this afternoon, I should say this evening. And if you just tuned in, Red Foley, who has covered Major League Baseball for many years, here in the Sports Channel booth, you just saw Vita Blue, an outstanding pitcher. I faced Vita Blue back in 1969 when he was in Des Moines, Iowa. Some old Mets right there, Red. Yeah. Hey, I thought you. Why don't you tell them while we're at it? Tell them about the home run you hit over the uh, auxiliary. Do we have there. the time? You know, that's the thing. I don't think they had videotape back then, so they'll think I'm lying. But there you, you're looking at some of the old Mets. It's too bad that Jerry Kuzman and Tom Seaver couldn't be here because they were very, very important. But right now we will go down on the field to Bob Murphy. Which we don't need. Tug McGraw uttered a cry that became famous. He said, you got to believe. And in the month of September, the Mets won 19 and lost only eight. They climbed from last place to first place. They played a dynasty team, the Cincinnati Reds, in the playoffs. They defeated the Reds. They went on to the World Series. 
and they were going to play another dynasty team. Dick Williams, Oakland A's, who would win three straight world championships. Well, here today on Old Timers Day, Upper Deck Heroes Day, the Mets at Upper Deck have invited back many of the performers of those two World Series teams of 20 years ago. First, we would like to present to you members of that 1973 World Championship team, the Oakland A's. The manager, terrific baseball individual. I've had the good fortune of knowing him for a lot of years. He was the A's manager. He played 13 years in the big leagues before he began managing. Many old time fans saw him playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. He's won four pennants and is just one of two managers to take three different teams to the Fall Classic. 1,571 managerial victories. That ranks 13th on the all time list. And his 12 series victories, that ranks number eight. He is the manager who won every place he went. The manager of the 73 A's, Dick Williams. Dick? Boy, he looks like he's in great shape now. This gentleman played parts of nine years in the majors. Detroit, Oakland, and the Cubs. A good defensive catcher. He was also a DH and played first base. Welcome, Tim Hosley. Originally a switch hitter, he became solely a left-handed batter after his rookie year, and he put together a 20-year career. Played with eight teams, saw action in four championship series, and a pair of World Series, where he posted a career postseason batting average of over 500. Let's welcome Jay Johnstone. A slick fielding infielder, he played in nearly a thousand games with the Brewers, the Cardinals, Rangers, Padres, and the A's. A solid member of the A's championship teams from 72 through 74, here is Ted Kubiak. The regular center fielder for the A's in the heart of their 70s dynasty, twice led the American League in stolen bases. 54 and 74, 75 and 76. He hit 273 in five years with Oakland. Also played for the Dodgers in the 78 World Series. And he stole 395 bases in 11 years. Here is a great speedster and base stealer, Billy North. A two-time All-Star in 67 and 69. He hit exactly 200 homers in a 13-year career, and that included two World Series appearances. In his final career at bat, in the 1972 World Series, he had a game-tying single in the eighth inning of game four. He got it off a man they called the Hawk, Clay Carroll. And now here is Don Mencher. A two-time All-Star in 68 and 69, he was in the majors just three months after graduating high school. What a start he had. He was 15 and 6 for the World Champion A's in 72, a member of the 73 and 74 teams as well, a 13-year major leaguer with five different teams. Here is John Blue Moon Odom. This player hit 330 for the Milwaukee Braves in 1964. One of the eight 300 plus seasons he had. In his career, he improved that mark with a National League leading 366 in 1970. And that included a 31 game hitting streak. He hit 299 over 15 years in the big leagues. And he finished just two hits short of a career 300 mark. He was truly a magnificent hitter. Rico Cardi. This gentleman was the leadoff batter and the shortstop for the Oakland A's. That was on those dynasty teams in the 70s. He hit a pair of home runs in his first big league ball game. In 65, he led the American League in hits. In 68, and then topped the American League in stolen bases 
six times. His 649 stolen bases in his 19-year career, that ranks 10th on the all-time list. He homered in Game 7 of that 73 World Series against the New York Mets. That gave the A's a 4-0 lead, and they went on to win. Here is Bert Campanaris. He earned 143 saves in his career. Now that was good for 13th on the all-time list at the time he retired. That was after the 1974 season. In 73, and many Met fans will remember this, he became the only pitcher ever to appear in all seven games of a World Series. He earned a pair of saves in the A's triumph over the Mets. In 1972, his ERA was 1.36. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Daryl Knowles. This gentleman was the most valuable player in the 72 World Series for the Oakland A's. He batted 348. He had a then record four home runs. He played for 14 years in the major leagues, and he finished his career with 201 home runs. He is now a coach with the world champion Toronto Blue Jays, Gene Tennis. A really important cog in the A's dynasty of the 70s, a three-time All-Star, a three-time Gold Glove winner in the outfield, a 300 hitter in World Series play. You can still remember those wonderful defensive plays he made in left field to save victories for the A's. He is here with us tonight, Joe Rudy. In 1970, he led the American League second baseman with a 1994 fielding percentage. The San Francisco native's best year was his last in the major leagues when he hit 261 for the world champion Oakland A's. A seven year major leaguer with the Senators, let's welcome this former White Sox and A's star, Tim Cullen. This hard throwing southpaw pitched for 17 years in the big leagues. In 71, he won the Cy Young and the MVP awards. He had a 182 ERA, eight shutouts, 301 strikeouts. That's including 17 and one 11 inning ball game. Still the only pitcher to ever start and win an All-Star game in both the National League and the American League. He has a lifetime record of 209 at 161, 37 shutouts. What a wonderful performer. Vida Blue. Vida? And tonight's 1973 A's team features a member of the Hall of Fame, holder of the World Series saves mark with seven, a 1.35 classic ERA in the World Series, the bullpen ace of the Oakland dynasty of the 70s. He earned the series MVP honors in 74, by winning game one, then saving Oakland's th other three victories against the Dodgers. Ladies and gentlemen, he is a five-time All-Star, won the American League MVP and Cy Young Awards in 81, while helping the Brewers to the Western Division title. His lifetime totals included a 2.90 ERA, 114 wins, 341 saves. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame along with Tom Seaver here is Raleigh Fingers. There they are, ladies and gentlemen, the 1973 world champion Oakland A's. And now let's meet the 73 New York Mets. Tonight, the Mets manager played for the Dodgers, A's, Giants, and Mets. He retired as a player and became the bullpen coach for Washington under the late and wonderful Gil Hodges. He moved himself to the New York Mets in 1968 and was here for many, many years as an outstanding coach. From Brooklyn, Joe Pignatano.
This very good looking redheaded man now lives in Sarasota, Florida. He homered twice in the 73 World Series. He started the 69 League Championship Series with 385 mark. He played mostly at third, but every now and then you'd see him at second base when you needed a big hit to drive in a big run. You wanted to see Wayne Garrett. Wayne? He shared time in center field in 73 with the incomparable Willie Mays. In seven years in the majors, he played for the Expos, Phillies, Mets, Cardinals, and Padres, seeing action all over the outfield. He could run and he could really shag them. Don Hahn. This right-hander first came up with the Mets in 68. He was a member of the Mets postseason rosters in 69 and 73. He shut out Steve Carlton and the Cardinals for his first Major League win in 1969 and had his best year in 72 with a 2.80 ERA in 111 games. We welcome back Jim McAndrew. This tall, thin left-hander was acquired by the Mets in the winter before the 73 season, and he had his best year for the National League champion Mets. He went 12 and three, including eight straight wins, and that helped New York jump from last to first. He pitched three innings in the World Series and did not allow a run. Coming here from his home in Louisiana, welcome home left-hander George Stone. And if you like to be around intelligent, fun people, this guy you would love spending an evening with. His major league career consisted of two years with the Mets, 73 and 74. But he was a key backup outfielder with that 73 championship team. He saw action in two games during the World Series against the A's. We all knew him as the Stork. Of course, his real name is George Theodore. In 73, the Mets and their amazing catcher, Jerry Grody, had to part ways for a couple of months. Jerry suffered a fractured arm when he was hit by a pitch. And the Mets brought up a young left-handed hitting catcher, jumping him all the way from Class A ball, and what a job he turned in. He became a rookie of that 73 season and would stay and spend his entire career with the New York Mets as a catcher and a solid left-hand pinch hitter, Ron Hodges. Welcome back, Ron. This delightful personality won 20 games for St. Louis in 64. Now that was a championship team. By the way, that year, the pennant race, there were five teams still fighting for the pennant the last weekend of the season. He threw nearly 2,500 lifetime innings, appeared in four games of that 73 World Series. He had a save in game four. We're delighted to have back with us tonight, Ray Sadecki. This left-hander was the 1972 Rookie of the Year with the New York Mets, an all-star from 74 to 76. He won 14 games. He had 205 strikeouts in 73. And in the League Championship Series, after the Mets and Tom Seaver got beat two to one in game one, he came back in game two and shut out Johnny Bench, Pete Rose, Tony Perez, and the Big Red Machine. He allowed him exactly two hits. He also won a game of the World Series. He won 125 games in 12 years. His home now is in Arlington, Texas. Here is John Matlack. He is a member of the Mets Hall of Fame. He came right out of high school, played his entire 18-year Major League career with the New York Mets as a very classy first baseman. In the waning years of his career, he became the best pinch hitter in the National League. Welcome back, Eddie Cranepool. You just can't find, back over the years of baseball, a more outstanding defensive catcher than our next guest. 
Tom Seaver always referred to him as my catcher. And it was in 73 when the Mets sank to last place. He was out with an injury. He suffered a broken arm. He missed two months of the season. He came back late in the year. He was always a great catcher. But in September, when the Mets won 19 and lost eight and overhauled everybody in their division, his bat just caught on fire and he drove in one big run after another. And he's also a member of the War of Mets Hall of Fame. From his home in San Antonio, Texas, Jerry Grody. In their history, the Mets have had very few players with more talent than our next guest. And in 69, that magical year of the first championship, he batted 340. And that figure still stands as the best in Mets history. A lifetime 281 hitter. Here from Mobile, Alabama, a Mets Hall of Famer, Cleon Jones. If you've been a Mets fan for a while, you remember that in that 73 series when the Mets were playing the Reds, a pretty good fight broke out around second base by a pretty good shortstop and somebody named Rhodes. They wrote about it for years to come. Well, this skinny young guy came up to the New York Mets in 1965 and carved quite a career for himself. He became the shortstop that all future shortstops talent will be measured by. He would coach for the New York Mets, and yes, he would manage the New York Mets, and he is still with the New York Mets as a scout, and he's here tonight, the one and only Buddy Harrelson. <laughs> Known as the Cat, this gentleman was a three-time All-Star and a two-time Gold Glove winner in a 12-year career as the second baseman with the Braves and the Mets. Certainly one of the best trades the Mets ever made was when they acquired him at a swap with the Braves. He was the toughest man in the league to strike out. And I'm happy to say that his son, Bernie, is now playing for the St. Lucie Mets and having a dynamite year. But a real all-star is back with us, Felix Mian. Felix? He was an all-star six times in his major league career. Retired after 23 years of the big leagues. We always called him the thinking man's hitter. What a marvelous hitter. When he wrapped it up, 2,716 hits, 292 home runs. In the 73 World Series, his competitive flames never were higher. Although badly injured after crashing into the right field wall, he refused to come out even though he had to throw the ball underhanded. He had 423 in the World Series. He was truly magnificent, and he is today. And by the way, last night in Midtown Manhattan, he hosted all of our Upper Deck heroes. They were there at his restaurant. We all know it as Rusty's. Rusty Staub. Rusty? I hope I didn't miss anybody. And if not, ladies and gentlemen, these are the Upper Deck heroes on hand. And I think all of you know what a wonderful job Upper Deck does in presenting these old timers games and that it goes to the monies that are raised through this and donated by Upper Deck. Go to help many ball players and their families from another era when big money was not paid and people that could really use the help. It is really a marvelous project. Now we have the old timers game coming up. Relax and enjoy it. And thank you very much. All right, stay with us. When we come back, we'll take a look at the old timers do their thing. Well, back here live at Shea Stadium in Flushing, New York. Just a few moments, your baseball cards will come to life. And if you do have your baseball cards today, make sure you have upper deck. Upper deck. The helping out the Bat Foundation to help out retired players who have fallen on hard times. So Richard McWilliams, owner of Upper Deck Baseball Cards, doing a major part in helping former baseball players throughout the country. They're putting on the Upper Deck Heroes of the Game in each and every city throughout baseball. And it becomes very exciting. I guess the first old-timers game was played at Yankee Stadium, Mr. Foley? 
Yeah, they say it was, uh, well, actually, with the Lou Gehrig day, they didn't play a game, but they brought back the old 27 Yankees. Um, I think the game started after, you know, like after the war, they started to put the actual game together, but uh, they brought back old-timers, and it was a very popular, because uh, people want to see these guys. All right, they're 20 years older in this case. Well, as far as uh, seeing guys 20 years older, we're going to go downstairs to two veterans, Rusty Staub and his special guest, Raleigh Fingers. Rusty? All right, we have Raleigh Fingers with us, a member of the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. Raleigh, how are things going? What are you up to now? Oh, I'm, I'm working from 9 to 5 in San Diego during the week, and uh, i got a pretty good job with a communications company. I'm director of sales, and uh, it keeps me busy, but I still find time for a few golf games here and there. You played on more than one ball club, but there had to be something special about the Oakland Athletics. Uh, yeah, there was. It was, uh, you know, this is before the free agency came into into play, and uh, you know, we had a group of guys that we played together for about seven, eight years, all, all you know, all together, the whole time, even up through the minors. So we played together as a team, and uh, we won together as a team. And then nowadays, you know, free agency guys are jumping around all over the place, so you're not going to see it like it was, like it used to be. Any special memory of that 1973 uh, World Series? Uh, you know, I got the I got the final out in a couple of games, which which made it pretty pretty you know, gratifying for me. But I think just winning overall. You guys had a great pitching staff and a, a good hitting ball club. And uh, when we went back to San, or went back to Oakland in Game Five, I, or after Game Five, I thought we were going to get beat. But uh, uh, you know, with Matt Lack and Seaver out there, but then, you know, things worked out well for us. Well, I think this game is underway. We're going to check it out. Thanks for spending okay. this time with us. All right, we'll see you okay, later. Raleigh. Take it up, friends. Okay, Rusty. You just saw George Theodore make a fine play, robbing Burt Campaneras of extra bases. Burt Campaneras, Red. I, to me, when you talk about table setters, when you look at Burt Campaneras and Bill North, who's batting right now, those were the, the first real table setters that caused a lot of damage. Yes, they did. Although... You know, people still talk if you go way back when uh, Hack and Herman were with the Cubs. They were table setters, too. But uh, you had Campaneras. That guy had some power people didn't realize. Well, Bert Campaneras and had a home run in the 73 World yes, Series. Yes, he did. John Matlock pitching to Bill North. And it's bounced across the infield. But they get Bill North. And Wayne Garrett doing the job. Very popular personality here in New York. And how about John Matlick? Look at that, 125 wins, 126 losses over his career. And you have some fond memories of him, Red, in covering the Mets. Oh, yeah. I remember the night he got hit with a foul ball, or a foul ball here. It went for two bases into the dugout. It hit him right up in the forehead. <laughs> I'll bet John has fond memories of that. You're looking at Joe Rudy betting. He hit 264, but... He was as steady as you could get in the American League, and they had some exciting championship years in Oakland. And he was a major part of it. He was the ultimate pro. Well, how about this guy, Buddy Harrelson, over at Eddie Cranepool. It's the first time I've seen those 73 Oakland A's go down one, two, three. Buddy Harrelson doing the job. So the A's failed to score in the top half of the first inning. We go to the bottom of the half. And it's the 73 A's nothing, the Mets nothing. So you're looking in at the New York Met dugout from the 73 World Series. Exciting times here in New York, but I mentioned to you in the opening, Red, the one thing I remembered was Mike Andrews' fiasco. <laughs> Boy, was that something. Mike Andrews is a good player. It's too bad he had to put up with that abuse. And, of course, Charlie Finley, um, if he was trying to unite his ball club, he did a nice job of it. Yeah, he did it of uniting them or yes. <laughs> uniting them against, against him. Against him. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was, that was really a sad, uh, that was a sad occasion. The guy was hurt. Yeah, he was hurting. But, but, you know, pull a guy out of a lineup in the middle of a World Series. Well, I think they made up the excuse he was hurting. Well, sure, they tried to get. Because of the errors. Yeah. But anyway, we talked about John Matlack, and uh, Red Foley said he remembers him getting hit in the forehead with a line drive, and it was a two-base hit. Let's get down to Rusty Stop and find out if John remembers that. Rusty? John Matlack, you look like you're in pretty good shape. You ready to go? No, I'm just <laughs> glad it's over with. That's, that's the most balls anybody's missed off of me in 10 years. <laughs> now, you are in baseball still, right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, well, where are you? 
pitching coach in the White Sox organization in Sarasota, Florida State League. Um, in reminiscing about 1973, what's the things that stand out for you? Oh, coming back from getting hit in the head. Uh, <laughs> was that the year you got hit in the head with the line drive? In May, May 8th, got hit in the forehead, fractured my skull, managed to come back with that without too many problems, I don't think, <laughs> none that I know about anyway. And just the, the way the team came together toward the end of the season. We scuffled, never really got buried, but never really played well until the last six weeks, and then everybody sort of gelled, and things worked well, and we won, and it was a great feeling. Good to have you with us. It's good to see you. Take care, man. Okay. Francis? Okay, Rusty. You're looking at one of the hardest throwers ever to tow the rubber in the major leagues, Vita Blue. Look at that record. 209 wins, 161 losses. Will you ever forget his rookie year in the major leagues? Pitching to Felix Mian. Vita Blue dominated American League hitters for many years, and there's a chopper to third. Long throw, and they just do get Felix Neon. So Tim Cullen over to Don Minster. Two men are gone here in the first inning for the Met Old Timers. I shouldn't say old timers. I'll say the heroes of the game. And here's a big hero here in New York. Cleon Jones, Red. Oh, Cleon. Highest average ever put together by a New York Met. And you're looking at footage of Cleon Jones back in 73 and there he takes the strike. You'll notice something about old timers games. They look the same as they did then except everything is in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> well this guy was never slow. Vita blow. Well he could bring it. Vita Blue, of course, coming up in, with the Oakland A's and having an outstanding career. 17 seasons in the major leagues, and that's what he did so well over the years, striking out batters. But I guess Cleon Jones is going to get another opportunity. And here's Vita Blue pitching in the World Series back in 73, facing Cleon Jones. And there, Cleon Jones hits a long drive, and that ball is gone. But a different story here as Cleon Jones just struck out against Vita Blue. Vita doing a lot of work now for the San Francisco Giants. I guess they're discussing that last pitch. But Cleon never did like to strike out. <laughs> Well, he was a tough man to get out. What was his highest average? About 340. It was 3.42 or something like that. He just missed a batting crown. I think Pete Rose beat him out. Well, before you, we figure that out, as you see Cleon Jones going out to the outfield, we're going to go back down to my colleague, Rusty Stop. Rusty? All right, Francis. We have Vita Blue with his Vita. Some great years with the Oakland Athletics. Was 73 the best? Uh, actually... I think 73 might have been my best year because I was I won the Cy Young in 71. I held out in 72, and I, you know, just kind of regrouped and came back and won 20 games in 73. So uh, I think it might have been my best season by far because I had to go through what I, you know, all the stuff I went through just to, to get to that season. And uh, you know, to come back and regroup and win 20 games, I think was a credit to me as an individual. But uh, Charlie Finley put us through a lot, man. He put us through a lot. Did that help you as a team, though? Yeah, it did. You know, collectively, we had that one common goal, which was to, you know, play hard every day and prove to Mr. Finner that we were worth of a few bucks that we that he was paying us. And uh, it paid off. And we were just a bunch of scrappy guys who, again, had that one common goal. You know, we put each other in arbitration and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, as it turns out, I was very fortunate to be a part of, uh, you know, a good group of young guys that uh, had a desire and will to win. And that's what we accomplished. Thanks for talking to us. It's my pleasure. Okay. Francis? Okay, Rusty. George Stone now pitching for the 73 Met Ball Club. There's George Stone right there, Red. What do you remember about George? Uh, George is, was one of those guys that uh, you, you'd say, how does he get the batters out? But he got them out because he had good stuff. He didn't break anybody's bat off. Uh, that's a typical buddy play. Oh, this guy could hit Rico oh. Cardi. Hmm. Hit line drives all over the place. 
especially with those two strikes on him. Takes outside. He still has that stance, doesn't he, Red? Yes, he does. I want to see if George gets into his kitchen. <laughs> and that quick bat by Rico Cardi he pops the ball up. Wayne Garrett looks to Ron Hodges, and Ron makes the grab. Now, they told us for years, if you see a ball like that and you're a catcher, let the infielder take it. Ron Hodges moving very well. Yeah, some footage of Ron Hodges coming out of the shoot. Perfect throw to second base. And the batter now for the Oakland A's, Don Mincher. Outstanding hitter, but he had his, the, the great years with the Minnesota Twins. Yeah, but he's, he had a great stroke. Great left-handed stroke. How about that ball club with the Twins? This guy, Harmon Killebrew, Bob Allison. Yeah, they had some hammers over there, didn't they? An outstanding career with the, Oakland, or with the uh, Minnesota Twins. Right now facing the left-hander for the first time maybe in a number of years. He was a Two-time All-Star in 67 and 69. Pulls the ball foul. He hit exactly 200 homers in his 13-year career that included two World Series appearances. But his final at bat was in 1972 in the World Series. He had a game-tying single in the eighth inning of Game 4 off the Reds' Clay Carroll. And he strikes out. You didn't see him do it very often in those days with the Minnesota Twins. That was a George Stone pitch. And I mentioned swing. Had him way out in front. Keep in mind, none of these guys had the opportunity to take batting practice. Maybe this gentleman right here, Gene Tennis. The coach with the world champion Toronto Blue Jays. We talk about a clutch player. Some pretty good stats. 201 home runs, 674 RBIs, and they all meant something with this guy. Gene Tennis, a first baseman with the A's, also a catcher. So he's a lot younger today, doesn't he, Red? Yeah. <laughs> Of course, a few guys from the, the Oakland A's 73 team not able to make it. Sal Bando, who's the general manager of the Milwaukee Brewers and was a very important part of that ball club. And Reggie Jackson. Catfish Hunter. Catfish Hunter was extremely important. Kenny Holtzman, there's a shot in the center field. Do you think Gene Tennis has taken some batting practice with those Blue Jays? Every day, I'll bet. Here's that compact stroke by Gene Tennis. Now see, he's cheating. He's getting some extra swings up there in Toronto. So Gene Tennis on first base. And Jay Johnstone, the batter. Jay takes down low ball one. Jay told me a story before this game that when he joined the Oakland A's, there was a phone call for him in the dugout. The call was from the owner, Charlie Finley. The manager, Dick Williams, picked up the phone and said, Jay, you have a phone call. <laughs> Charlie wanted to know how his shoes fit. Was he comfortable? <laughs> what are Charlie Finley's in Chicago today watching this game? Charlie, one of the real mavericks in baseball, had some great ideas. Responsible for night games during the World Series, the All-Star Game. That orange ball never made it, though, did it? No. You know, I still have one. I got it in the 75 All-Star Game from Charlie. Heard Catfish Hunter in an interview the other day. He said they were too slick. Pitchers couldn't grip them. 
And Jay Jones still fouls the ball off. Jay now doing some television work for Sports Channel in Philadelphia, broadcasting the Philadelphia games. And there's a looper in the center field, so Jay Johnstone picking up a base hit. Gene Tennis with that great speed third. all the way to third. And we talked to you about Charlie Finley. Let's take a look at this. Here's Bob Hope throwing out the first ball. Bowie Kuna and Bob Hope's right. And on his left, there's Charlie Finley dressed for the occasion. The only thing missing is the donkey. <laughs> What, is the donkey here at, at Shea Stadium today? <laughs> and now Ted Kubiak. Ted taking ball one. You're right. So it was Charlie O. the mule. We'll have to bring him up here later on today. Is he still with us? <laughs> and Ted takes outside again. Stay with us now. We'll be going back downstairs to my colleague Rusty Staub talking to some of the 73 Oakland A's. And yeah, ground ball up the middle. Buddy Harrelson doing the job over to Felix Mian. You saw that so many times during the 73 campaign. Oh boy, this guy can do it. Yeah, we're going to take a look at that again. Buddy Harrelson, who holds a clinic on the Dynamite Show, which you see right here on Sports Channel, flipping to Felix Mian, doing it the right way and getting the job done. And a well played ball game so far by the 73 Mets and the 73 Oakland A's. You see, no score. We're in the middle of the second inning. Some great memories from. That World Series, it wins seven games. How about this name right here? Blue Moon Odom. Charlie Finley gave people nicknames. That Catfish Hunter will tell you when he signed, Charlie Finley was at his house. Said, do you have a nickname? He said, no. He said, you can't play in the big leagues without a nickname. So he gave him one, Catfish. Now we're going to go downstairs to... My colleague Rusty Staub, and he has a guy who was very popular here in New York, Wayne Garrett. Rusty? All right, Francis Wayne, you're down in Florida now, right? In Florida, Sarasota. What are you up to? Well, just working. Uh, I'm doing golf course irrigation. Been doing it for the last five and a half years. 1973 was a tremendous comeback for the Met. What, what was the one thing that you felt was the best thing that happened to New York Mets that year to get them around the bend? Well, Rusty, from what I remember, I think our pitching staff pretty much ailed the whole year except for the last month of the season when everybody got healthy and everyone came around. And, of course, you know, when our pitching staff is healthy, people are in trouble. So, And I think that's what got us there. It's just our pitching staff. It's always kept us there. Well, thanks, Francis. I'm going to throw it up to you. This inning's getting ready to start. Okay, Rusty. Does Wayne Garrett look like Ron Howard? Ron yeah. Howard from there is a There is a resemblance. Mayberry? And happy days. And Blue Moon Odom pitching to Eddie Cranepool. And Eddie takes outside. Eddie played in four games in that 73 World Series. He fouls the ball off. Very popular personality here in New York. A lucky guy. He played his high school ball, set all kinds of records here in New York. And we're taking a look at some footage of Eddie Cranepool's career. Back live, and Eddie takes the ball. A lot of memories with Eddie Cranepool, Red. I'll tell you one thing about Eddie. He was a guy that, he was 18, 19 years old. He could tell you what every pitcher in the league would throw to him. He knew how they were going to pitch him. And he hit that ball there, and he hits this ball here. A base hit for Eddie Cranepool.
One of the best defensive catchers who ever played the game right there, Jerry Grody. Jerry, an old teammate of Rusty Stobbs in Houston. And they ended up playing on the same team together here in New York. There's some old time footage of Jerry. Number 15 coming out of the chute. Perfect throw. So Jerry Grody taking a, was that a breaking ball? You can't be throwing breaking balls here. Oh, and there's a shot down a left field line, foul. I want to thank our guy downstairs who does an outstanding job putting all this footage together, Matt Ryan. Matty doing just a tremendous job once again here. <laughs> Jerry was with the Mets 66 to 77 and he hits the ball hard foul. Do you ever see a better throwing catcher than Jerry Grody Red? No. He was a great receiver and had a great arm. Worked that pitching staff very well. Scored two runs back in that 73 series. And he loops the ball in the right field. A base hit. Jay Johnstone getting the ball back in. So the Mets from 73 have runners on first and second. And the battle will be Ron Hodges. Stay with us here on Sports Channel coming up. The Phillies and the Mets in the, four, in the third game of this four-game series. Doc Gooden will be on the mound for the Mets. He'll be opposed by Danny Jackson. And Ron Hodges taking the ball. Well, he hits a rope. Good base running by Ed Crane pool, Red. Well, he never took too much of a lead. <laughs> Ron Hodge is blocking home plate. Some, some footage of Ronnie doing the job. He'll be going back down between innings to Rusty Staub. He'll be interviewing some of the personalities who are filling up the dugouts with memories today. And once again, want to thank Upper Deck Trading Cards for supporting the heroes of the game. George Theodore, who missed quite a bit of the 73 season with a dislocated hip red. Yeah, he had that collision in the outfield. Yeah, he, stuck. he could swing the bat. And became a popular personality here in New York. They had a lot of popular personalities in New York back then. Here's George Theodore. Nice play. And he gets jammed a little bit. They make the play at third over to first. In time. Double play. So well, the Mets of 73 fail to score here. They had two base runners. Blue Moon Odom doing the job once again for the Oakland A's. And we go to the top of the third inning. Still no score, the A's and the Mets. Okay, now we're going to go back downstairs to Rusty Staub with his special guest. All right, I'm here with Gene Tennis. Now, you've had a, a really unusual thing. Not only were you the hero of 72, you were there 72, 3, and 4. Was it more exciting for you to be on a team that won or to coach last season when the Blue Jays won? Well, it's obvious to be on a team that won, obviously. But, you know, being the first time that uh, I was on a club that as a coaching end of it and was able to win a world championship was very exciting for myself, plus the people that, they're, that are with the Blue Jay organization for 16 years and trying to win this thing. And finally last year, the reality came true for them and uh, it, was a, it was really exciting for the people in uh, Toronto. Well, 72 probably stands out 
more than 73 for you, but you hit a great run with them. Thanks for talking with us. We're going to check this inning out here. Okay, my pleasure. Yes. Okay. Francis? Okay, Rusty, and a new pitcher, Ray Sadecki. Won 20 games for the Cardinals, 1964 championship team. He's had a lot of success in his major league career. And Tim Cullen fouls the ball off. Tim played seven years in the major leagues. You're looking at the stats right there. And right back to Ray Sadecki. He flips Eddie Greenpool. One down. It's amazing how quick Ray is. Eh? And we're going to take some take a look at some footage of Ray pitching a few years back there with the Mets. What do you remember about Ray, Red? Sadecki, he was a he was a a good left-handed pitcher, but he was a character. He and Rube Walker could make anybody laugh. Ray was good for the for any clubhouse he was in. So look at Tim Hosley batting against Ray Sadecki. And Tim hits a ground ball to short. Buddy Harrelson gets him. He's ready. He heard about that trade. Tony well, he Fernandez. was always ready. Tony Fernandez now in Toronto, and Buddy Harrelson is trying out today. And here's a guy who can play shortstop. Bert Campaneris. As Red mentioned before, he had power, he had speed. He could play defense. Steal bases. We even talked about that manager of the Oakland A's who did an outstanding job over the years, Dick Williams. Dick Williams was a great manager with the Red Sox, then the Oakland A's. There's Bert Campanaris making a play, and here he is hitting a ground ball to the right side. So, whoop, right through Felix Mian's legs. And Campy going the other way again, hitting a bullet into right field. He's still in good shape. Talking about Dick Williams, Dick Williams was able to utilize this ball club and help them win games. He would get Bert Camp and Harris on base. He'd steal second. Bill North drive him. Bill North would steal second. They had an outstanding team back in the 70s, the Oakland A's. I'm looking for Campy to steal right now. There's a strike. Bill North hit 285 for those 73 A's. Had 53 stolen bases in 73. And he appeared in 146 games. Ray is dropping down lower and lower with that arm, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> His knuckles are going to be scraping the mound. <laughs> Ray still has some good stuff. Bill taking another pitch from Ray Sadecki. One day when we were playing the Oakland A's, the Kansas City Royals, Doug Bird was pitching for the Kansas City Royals, and Bill took a swing at a ball, and a bat flew out of his hand, went out by the pitcher's mound. Everybody was just talking around home plate, and Bill went out to get the bat, and all of a sudden, he was in a fist fight with Doug Bird. It started in the minor leagues. Oh, he didn't like him from the last picture, huh? <laughs> There's Dick Williams. Ooh, almost. <laughs> He's warning him.
And Bill North hits a fly ball to the right side. It drops in. And watch Campy run. He's going to score. So Bill North with a triple driving in Burt Campanaris. Boy, that looks familiar. <laughs> now here's Burt Campanaris avoiding a tag in 1973. That's a great slide right there. Yeah. How about Raleigh Fingers batting? Popping the ball up. Felix Mian making a grab, and that'll do it for the A's. But they pick up a run. They go to the bottom of the third inning here at Shea. Heroes of the game. Old, the upper deck old-time heroes of the game as Ray Sadecki leaves the field. And it's 1-0 in favor of the Oakland A's from 73. Now we're going to take a look at a celebrated incident between the Cincinnati Reds and the New York Mets. Ground ball hit down to first base. Milner has it, throws to Buddy Harrelson, one to first, double play! And a fight breaks out, a fight breaks out. Pete Rose and Buddy Harrelson, both clubs spill out of the dugouts, and a wild fight is going on. Gary Kuzman's in the middle of the fight. Everybody is out there. Buddy Harrelson and Pete Rose got into it. Rose apparently thought that Harrelson had done something in making the double play. Rose outweighs Harrelson about 35 pounds. And now... Well, there's Buddy Harrelson down in the Med dugout, and we're going to go down to the Med dugout to Rusty Stop. Rusty? Well, a quick question for George Theodor. Stork, that was a long way out there. I got <laughs> bad news for you, Rusty. I pulled a muscle. I think you got to go out there. <laughs> that dog ain't going to hunt. But we're getting ready to start this inning, George. Good to have you with us today. It's great to be here. Okay, Francis, let's okay, start this inning. Okay, Rusty. Upper deck heroes of the game. Don Hunt. Don hit 241 back in 73. That was a 73 series. And Don takes a strike. Daryl Knowles pitching for the Oakland A's. Think they had a pretty good pitching staff? <laughs> this guy could have been a stopper for anybody. He, would, he was a setup man for Raleigh Fingers. Appeared in all seven games in the World Series. He um, just an outstanding pitcher. How about the starting staff for the Oakland A's back then? Catfish Hunter. Kenny Holtzman, Vita Blue. Foul out of play. Then things got tight late in the game. Of course, they had Blue Moon on them. Things got tight late in the game. In came Raleigh Fingers. Line drive, base hit. So Don Hahn picking up a base hit. That's trying to get back in this game. Losing right now by one run. Buddy will punch the other way. Well, Buddy showed us he could, he could play shortstop right now. We'll see if he can still hit. Remember the New York Mets from 65 to 77. You're right, Reddy punches the ball the other way. He hit 250 in the 73 World Series. He and Pete Rose became very close friends. Outside, Buddy was a, won the gold glove in 1971. Up high. Here's Buddy Harrelson, and he's bunting the ball. How about those old pirate uniforms in that footage? With, yeah, with the vests. Mm. 
See if Bunny gets a base hit here. If he gets a base hit, he might be playing today. He went the other way. A chopper to second base. They get the force. And Bert could not get the ball over to first base. Don Hahn with a nice slide in the second base. Inside to Wayne Garrett. Is that Wayne or is that Ron Howard? <laughs> Ground ball, base in in the right field. And Buddy Harrelson holds on to second base, so Wayne Garrett still swinging the bat well. Buddy used to go to third on those. <laughs> Here's a old time footage of Wayne Garrett slapping the ball into left center field. How about those old Padre uniforms? Felix is choking up a little, like he always did. Fouls the ball out of play. Felix's son plays for the Port St. Lucie Mets and made the all star team this year. He's a switch hitter. And Felix told me before the game he does not choke up. There's a base hit. That's when you're hitting in good luck. Look at Buddy Harrelson go. They were all tied at one. Wayne Garrett going to third. <laughs> you think Felix took some batting practice down there in Port St. Lucie where he coaches? When, when you can make it hit the first base bag, you know somebody up there loves you. And now Cleon Jones. Takes up high, ball one. Fouled off. And we'll see, take a look at some old footage of Cleon Jones. Hits the ball hard right there and over the center field wall. You know, we talked about Dick Williams, manager of the Oakland A's. How about the manager of the New York Mets back in 73? Yogi. Yogi Berra. Outside to Cleon Jones. And back in 73, two phrases were coined that became nationally famous. You got to believe. And it ain't over till it's over. I can also remember one night Somebody come in and said to him, it was Cleon or Milner, I forget which, couldn't play tonight. And Yogi says, why are the guys who get hurt are always the ones you need? <laughs> <laughs> and Darrell Knowles looks back. Garrett to third and catches Jones at first. Yeah, Yogi Barrett did a fine job managing these 73 Mets. Is he one of the most popular characters ever to put on a uniform in this country? Yogi Berra. Yogi's also one of those guys who has one of those most recognizable faces. You know, like Muhammad Ali mm -hmm. could walk into the middle of China and somebody would recognize Yogi. <laughs> Eddie Cranepool fouls it off. 18 years with the New York Mets. Broke Hank Greenberg's record for home runs in high school here in the Bronx. How about that? A shot down a left field line. Two runs will score. How far will that go? Cruz is in a second base with a stand-up double. And here's some old footage of Eddie Cranepool going for a double. Driving in a couple runs, I should say a single. And Jerry Grody fouls the ball off. Crane knew how to use the whole field. Jerry Grody fouls the ball out of play.
Well, what a trade the Mets made, bringing Jerry Grody to New York. How important did he become to the ball club? Now, Burt Camp in there, his boost the ball, goes to oh, third. That's... And Eddie Crane pulls safe. So Campy trying to cut down Eddie Crane pull at third base. It's one of his rare errors. You know what? You didn't see many of those back in the 70s. I didn't give it an error. I'm not scoring. <laughs> Red Foley has been an official scorer for how many years? About 26. And Ron Hodges hits a high fly ball. And nice play, so that'll do it for the Mets. But they pick up two runs here in the third inning. And we've played three, and it's 3-1 Mets. Well, Reg, you know, um, Red just took his headset off. I wanted to get on him about his official scoring. Red, now, how many years again? 20? About 26. 26 years. Would you consider yourself a tough official scorer? I don't know what's tough. I mean, uh, would you give no. a hit or a break? Uh, it's not a question of a break to me, Fran. We don't make incorrect calls. We make unpopular ones. Oh, that's true. There's let a me, difference. Well, let me ask you, would you take a bribe? No. <laughs> Well, let's take a look. A famous play. The 2-1 pitch. Hit in the air to left field. It's deep. Back goes Jones by the fence. It hits the top of the fence. Comes back in play. Jones grabs it. The relay throw to the plate. They may get him. He's out. He's out at the plate. Could have started play, selling the playoff tickets when that happens. <laughs> well, Rusty Staub is downstairs with a fine relief pitcher, Daryl Knowles. Rusty? All right, Francis. Daryl Knowles, when I see you, I think of game six and three of the greatest pitches I saw back-to-back -back in my career that you struck me out on. I appreciate you saying that. I really do. Obviously, I didn't throw any of those tonight. I couldn't get anybody out, but that's the way it goes. But that was a great, uh, a great World Series we had, and I was lucky. You had a good, a good series. How was it being in a bullpen with Raleigh Fingers? Well, I tell you what, it's always nice to know that if you go out there and you mess up, you got that big guy behind you. And he did pick me up a lot in those years, and uh, he was obviously one of the best there ever was, and I'm just tickled to death for him to be in the Hall of Fame. Thanks for sending his time with us. Francis, we're going to start this inning. Okay, Rusty. And Rico Cardi steps in to face Jim McAndrew. Jim, a fine right-handed pitcher with those 73 Mets. Rico Cardi's with the Oakland A's, 73-78. Fouls the ball back. 15-year Major League career. Career average, 299. And it was a very hard 299. Takes up high. There's Jim McAndrew, some old footage right there, 1973. Rico Cardi hits a fly ball into foul territory and out of play here at Shea Stadium. You're watching the Upper Deck Heroes of the Game. And boy, they have some great heroes on this field. Read some great memories. Yeah, you're not kidding, friend. Rico Cardi back in 1970 led the National League with a 366 batting average and he hits a rope in a left center field. That looked familiar. Used to be a two base hit. <laughs> Still has that great bat speed, huh, Red? <laughs> I told you everything's in slow motion, friend. <laughs> Getting a runner for him. Is that Bill North going out there yeah. to run? So Bill might try to steal a base. Has anybody ever stolen the base in an old timers game? 
That's a good question. <laughs> I bet this could be a record. If he takes off, did I mention the batter? As we mentioned before, Don, a 13-year major league career. And had some marvelous seasons with the Minnesota Twins. He must have been on that twin ball club when Catfish Hunter threw a perfect game against the Twins. They had an outstanding hitting ball club. Was, was it 67, 68? He threw that perfect game? Uh, it was the late 60s, I know that. Pulled foul. But imagine throwing a perfect game against that Minnesota twin yeah. offensive lineup. Like I said, they had some hammers in that lineup. Well, they had Killebrew, Allison, Oliva. Was Carew up by He was up there by then. Yeah, he probably, yeah. Rich Rollins. It was interesting watching uh, Rusty Staub interview Vita Blue before. The way he came to the major leagues, all the fanfare. Charlie Finley really blowing it up. And then Charlie, remember the big day they gave uh, Vita a Cadillac? There's Is it? A, but he's going to turn a double play. Four, six, three, double play. We saw Felix and Buddy do it so many times back in 73. And take a look at it again. Ball hit hard. Felix with those soft hands flipping to Buddy Harrelson. Buddy throwing a bullet to first base. <laughs> we shouldn't be feeding that loudspeaker out there. Gene Tennis fouling the ball off. Mentioned before, Gene was a catcher and a first baseman. Boy, he drove every RBI. It was a big RBI when he drove it in. He and Sal Bando. Now, there's a rocket down a left field line foul. Now, you know Gene Tennis has been taking that batting practice up there in Toronto. Outside the Gene Tennis. Gene helped manage the Toronto Blue Jays when Cito Gaston was injured. And a lot of rumors circulated last year that Gene Tennis would become a major league manager and they felt he would go to Milwaukee. His old buddy. Yeah, that's because Sal is the general manager down there. Sal Bando, who wasn't able to make it today because of duties with the Milwaukee Brewers. Gene Tennis takes up high. Gene spent 15 years in the major leagues. Will you ever forget the 72 World Series? He was the most valuable player. Two homers, the first two at bats. Nobody had ever done it before. It's the ball hard into left field. Wayne Garrett did the right thing. He didn't get in front of it. Red, did you say base hit? I told you, I'm not scoring this game. <laughs> Would you give me a hit? Yeah. Yes. You're getting soft with these old timers. You're tough on these modern day players. Did you ever have a problem with any of these players on a, when you were official scorer? Not that I recall. Not with anybody out here on the field today, no. Blue, Blue Moon's hitting for himself. He always fancied himself as a hitter anyway, didn't he? He liked postseason play. It was 3-1 and career-wise in postseason play. Wayne Garrett cutting it off. They got the force at second base. We go to the bottom of the fourth inning here at Shea Stadium. And the 73 Mets, three. The 73 A's, one. So, Red, talking now, let me, let me get the scoop. We cannot, um, nobody's listening to us over the um, 
PA system here at Shea Stadium. Did you ever have a problem with these guys? Did you ever have to, like, push them against the wall and say, I'm not taking this anymore? Go ahead. No. They come clean. They won't. No, none problem. of these guys on the field. I don't recall having any problems. When I think about just looking at the names, no. Okay, we're going to let Red think a little bit more about this, and then I'm going to get no. back into this. And we're going to go downstairs to my colleague, Rusty Stop, who's with Don Hahn. Rusty? Okay, Francis. Don, it took forever to find you. Where have you been all these years? Oh, geez, I've been hiding in San Jose, California, <clears throat> out fishing and hunting and working a little bit. 73 has to bring back some great memories for you. Yeah, it was a great, great year, a great year. One of, one of the base years in baseball I remember, you know, of all time. We had a great team. We had a great year, and I was fortunate enough to get to play in a World Series. A lot of guys don't get that chance. Well, we wish you all success as things go on here. We have a game to do, so Francis, I'm going to throw this back up to you. Don, thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot, Rusty. Yeah. Okay, Rusty, as you look at Raleigh Fingers, Hall of Famer. On the mound right now for the Oakland A's. What a familiar sight. Oakland A's had a lead. Raleigh Fingers came in and held that lead. Dominated major league hitters. What's ironic about his career, he's known as a short man for the Oakland A's in their glory years, but he won the most valuable player in the Cy Young Award as a member of the Milwaukee Brewers. That's right. He went, uh, didn't he go free agent that year? Or? Well, I remember Charlie Finley uh, started trading everybody, and the Bowie Kuhn stepped in and said, You can't do that. That's right. He, he traded him, uh, Vider. Uh, Joe Rudy. But it wasn't, and there was a lot of money involved. There's Raleigh, footage of Raleigh pitching for the Milwaukee Brewers. There was a lot of money involved, and Bowie Kuhn didn't like that idea. George Stone might have a hit here. This is a great race. Raleigh Fingers wins it. Now, Red, um, since I have you up here and nobody can really hear this, I want to know, what, who did you really have a problem with as an official score? It had to be one player that complained. I never saw Healy. Yeah, I saw Healy get one hit. He had a home run here one day for Kansas at Kansas City against the Yankees. That was a mistake. It was a game winner. That's what I mean. It was a mistake. Don Hahn takes down low. But there had to be one player. It doesn't have to be on this field or here at the ball. But it had to be one player you wanted to shoot. Popped up and uh, out of play. Foul ball. Was there any incident that uh, stands out in your mind? Not really. Hmm. I know. I, as I say, the calls are not incorrect. They're unpopular. <laughs> Up high to Don Hahn. Just a program reminder here on Sports Channel. At 11 o'clock, thoroughbred action. There's a shot down the left field line. Don Hahn will go for two. He'll cruise into second base with a stand-up double. So Don Hahn on second base, and Jim McAndrew will be the batter. Jim pitched in 23 games for the 73 Mets, and he hits a high fly ball to left field. Joe Rudy makes the grab. Well, here's a... Outstanding defensive left fielder and a fine, fine offensive player. Here's a shot at Joe Rudy going against the wall. Yeah, it was a 72 World Series. Cincinnati Reds. Yep. And Wayne Garrett pops it up. Raleigh Fingers taking charge and makes the grab for out number three. So that'll do it for the Mets. Here in the fourth, they fail to score. We've played four, and That's that it. should be the final. So a lot of fun here for the 73 Oakland A's and the 73 New York Mets. And nobody got hurt. Some fine memories for the fans here at Shea Stadium. There's the final score, Mets three, A's one. Boy, you see some outstanding players out here today, guys reliving their past, enjoying themselves, 
I'll tell you, look at that Rico Cardi down there, Cleon Jones, Felix Mian, Blue Moon Odom, Burt Campanaris. I'm going to tell you, that guy made that ball club go. Now, that's an underrated player right there. He could pick it at shortstop, and he could get on base. He could steal a base, score those runs. He could, as Red said before, he could drive in runs, hit home runs. Just an outstanding player. And very, very underrated, as I mentioned. He and Bill North, they were intimidating as table setters. Both of them could steal bases. And you see Hall of Famer Raleigh Fingers, who pitched here today. Joe Pignatano, very popular personality here in New York. A, a musical tribute to the old timers. And we'll be back with more. <laughs> 